When you're getting started, you might feel like you have nothing going for you. But you've got the biggest advantage of them all. You've got time. And you can use that time however you want. But if you don't have a goal and a plan to get you where you want to be, you might be wasting a lot of that time. So my goal here today is to give you a blueprint you can use to become a better version of yourself and eventually get to a place where you can live life on your own terms. In other words, I'm suggesting a roadmap to both financial and creative freedom. If you're asking yourself how I know this works, well, it's because it's how I got to where I am today. I've got no boss, no 9-to-5 job, no bank loans, and no managers. And I can work from anywhere in the world, take a vacation whenever I want to, and choose the projects I want to work on. I'm also making about 10 times more than what I did when I got started. And of course, this wasn't easy. It took me 15 years to get here. But I didn't have a roadmap to guide me, so I made a lot of mistakes along the way, and I wasted a lot of time on things that weren't important looking back. So I'm hoping this presentation will at least show you what's possible and help guide your career path in the years to come. And while I have a background as a Ruby on Rails developer and I use Rails on a daily basis, it doesn't mean you can't use other languages or frameworks. But Ruby on Rails will give you an edge because it was built for this. Before we get started, I want to make one thing clear. This presentation is not about being a docile employee or how to get a job at a big tech company. It's much more than that. In fact, it's probably the opposite. It's what big tech companies don't want you to know. This presentation is all about understanding and creating value in the marketplace. If this sounds too abstract, don't worry. We'll get into what that means and how you can do it. I love this quote, and I don't know who said it, but it explains the concept pretty well. A bar of iron costs $5. Made into horseshoes, it's worth $12. Made into needles, it's worth $3,500. Made into balanced springs for watches, it's worth $300,000. Your own value is also determined by what you're able to make of yourself. This brings us to the first of the five secrets. Big tech jobs are a trap. If you've ever been curious about how much a developer makes, you've probably seen those mid to high six figure salaries that some people make at these big tech companies. And they're not fake. Some people do make those numbers, but those people are not the vast majority. And what's not so obvious is what you're giving up or what you could make otherwise. It's a choice between becoming a specialist or a generalist. As a specialist, you could command really high salaries by being one of the few people in the world that know how to solve a very expensive problem. To give you an example, if you're, let's say, a database optimization expert working for a company with a few hundred million users, your skills are super valuable to them because if one of the websites goes down, even for a few minutes, the company could be losing millions of dollars. So it makes sense for them to pay you a lot of money to solve a very expensive problem. On the other hand, being a specialist means you've spent most of your life getting good at a very niche set of technical skills, which is not bad as long as that's what you want to do. But being a specialist could be a risky place to be in because you've got to make sure you're always at the top of your game and hard to replace. Being a generalist means you learn a vast number of skills at a good enough level. You can do that because it takes less time to get good enough than it takes to be an expert. And you're covering a bigger surface area. Your skills are broad, not deep, and you can have a bigger impact. Instead of helping a handful of big companies like a specialist would, you could help many smaller and less sophisticated companies or people. That's what I mean by having a bigger impact. I'm not saying one is better than the other. There are different choices. But I'm going to focus this presentation on the generalist path and show you how far it can take you. So obviously, if you're just starting out, you're going to need a strong foundation to build on. And jobs are the perfect way to get that foundation. Forget about getting a high-paying job at a big tech company. 
optimize your job search for learning instead. Startups, for example, are a perfect way to do that because working in a startup will expose you to many areas of the business and you'll get a chance to learn a little bit of everything. You'll get to talk to the owner of the business, you'll be a part of the design and the product development meetings, and the list goes on. Even if your day-to-day -day job is technical, you'll have a better understanding of the context in which you're working and how your code will affect the business. But to make the most out of your learning, especially if you want to become good at writing Ruby on Rails code, there are a few things that worked well for me. And the first one is learning how to focus for long periods of time. This skill is critical because you'll be reading a lot of code and getting good at it takes focus and practice. There's a great productivity method developed by a guy named Francesco Cirillo in the 1980s called the Pomodoro method, and it works like this. You set a timer for 20 minutes. You focus on your task until the time runs out. Then you take a five minute break and you repeat this process four times. And then you take a 15 minute break. And then you repeat the whole thing as many times as you can. I don't know the science behind why this method works, but it magically does. At least that's been the case for me. Another helpful tool in your arsenal will be pen and paper. And I'm not saying you should write code on paper, but it's helpful to be able to jot down ideas and doodle some quick diagrams. The goal here is to be able to understand the problem, and both being able to focus and thinking on paper will help a lot in the process. Now, because your tool of choice is Ruby on Rails, you'll have one thing going against you because of the nature of the language you're likely to struggle with confidence in the code you write because it's tempting to skip some steps. Ruby on Rails is known to be able to ship features out the door in record time, but some people take it too far and there's a price to be paid for that. So if you want to become confident in the code you write, realize there is one thing you cannot skip, and that thing is called writing tests you'll have a much easier time writing Rails apps if you have tests than otherwise. Processes and automation also play a big role in adopting a testing mindset when you're working in a team setting. One last thing I'll mention about getting better at your craft is there's a difference between learning a topic for using it and learning a topic for teaching it. Teaching or talking about your topic requires a deeper level of understanding on your part, so if you really want to understand something, a good hack is to try and write a presentation or article about that topic, even if you don't publish it or you just show it to a friend. Secret number two, the next level up is out. If you're like most people, you've probably been taught that it's good for your career to climb up the corporate ladder. But I disagree. I'd say it's much better to get out as soon as you feel ready to take things on your own hands. To me, the next level up, after you've been employed for a while, is to start freelancing. And the reason I say that is because freelancing will teach you another set of skills that you'll probably never learn if you climb up the corporate ladder. Let's take a look at some of these skills and what they can get you. The first one on the list is learning to identify business goals. As an employee, you don't really care much about why you're doing what you're doing. You're being told what to do, not why it needs to be done. In other words, you cannot make the connection between your day-to-day -day tasks and how the business will improve after you're done. Why is this important? Well, if you know how your work is improving the business, you can quantify the value of your work. For example, a task like migrate our CSS to Flexbox is detached from the business outcome, which might be to allow mobile users to purchase from their phones. So if you wanted to put a number on how valuable your coding is to the business, it would be almost impossible in the first example. But in the second one, you could get a pretty accurate idea. For example, if you know that the website has about 10,000 visits per month, and 50% of those are on mobile devices, and 5% of those are buyers of a $100 product, you can come up with a number. So now you know that a few days of your coding are worth roughly $25,000 to the business. 
This is the kind of insight you get when you understand why you're doing what you're doing. And because you can now quantify the result, you'll be able to change your value proposition. You'll be able to go from, I know how to write code, would you please hire me, to, I can add an extra $250,000 a year to your business in just a few days for a flat fee of $30,000. Want to work together? That is called value pricing, and it's been one of the most impactful ideas that I discovered a few years back. It wasn't my idea. I was just curious enough and probably desperate enough to get out that I opened my mind up for new ideas. It's basically how you can increase how much you earn by doing the same thing. Instead of begging your boss for a raise, you can offer a value exchange instead. Secret number three, creating leverage. Going from employee to freelancer is a great step up, but there's a limit to how far you can get by trading time for cash. Simply because time is limited. As a freelancer, you're doing custom work for many different clients, which means each new contract will eat up the majority of your time. In other words, as a freelancer, you're always working to get paid. When you stop working, cash flow stops as well. That's how freelancing works. In that regard, it's no different than having a regular job, except it's less risky because you have multiple clients and you can choose better projects. But if you want to be able to take time off and not worry about not getting paid, you need to create leverage. In other words, you invest some amount of time once and you get paid in perpetuity for your work, pretty much like an actor or a songwriter does. Basically, you need to create long-term assets. Doesn't matter if they're info products like courses, books, or SaaS products, the point is you're building something that will keep paying you over long periods of time. And Rails is an amazing tool for building your own SaaS products, even if you don't have a huge budget or a lot of free time. It was built for the one-person business to be able to compete in the marketplace. That doesn't mean you're going to be able to build the next Facebook or Twitter, but you don't have to. You could have a few tiny SaaS products with just a handful of customers making the same amount as your 9-to-5 job. The difference, though, is now you don't have a boss, you're working on projects you believe in, you can help the kinds of people you enjoy being around, and you can decide how much time in the day you want to spend working. This is the freedom you can get by building your own business. So, how do you do it? Well, here's what I know from building SaaS products for over a decade. There's a tendency among developers to wait for the perfect idea, one that nobody else thought of. Once you get the idea of the perfect product, you start building it in secret so nobody can steal it from you. Then, you continue building it until you feel it's ready for prime time. That could take months or even years. And then, when the big day comes, guess what happens? Nothing. Can you guess how I know this? That's right, I've done it myself. And not just once, a few times actually. But thank God I've learned from that experience and I hope you won't make the same mistake. Because I've never seen that work. So, here's how you do it the right way. You need to go to the market. This means quite literally to go where people are already going to buy stuff. For example, if you're into book writing, you can go to Amazon and look at what other books are selling well and what people are writing in the comments. That's how you can get to know how they are looking to improve their lives and what's missing from the books already written on each topic. Once you know what people want and don't get, we can come up with a few solutions to solve people's problems. By using this process, you're not waiting for the muse or for inspiration to strike. You're researching and brainstorming better ideas. The thing that will set your product apart from other products on the market is how well it solves a problem. In other words, you need to build a better product than all the others currently out there. But you're not going to build anything just yet. Here's the thing. Anything you build will eat up a lot of your time. I've started building my Ruby on Rails course around February 2022. And almost one year in, I'm still working on it. 
So that's a significant time investment. You only want to do it if you know for sure it's worth it. And to make sure you avoid the time investment, you'll need to try to pre-sell it beforehand. This might sound like a sleazy sales tactic to you, but it doesn't have to be. You're not lying to anyone, it's quite the opposite. You're giving people an amazing deal in exchange for trusting you. So let's see how to do that. Let's say you want to build a SaaS product. How would you pre-sell it to validate your idea and offer your initial customers a good deal? Well, you probably have a good idea about what your product is going to be and why people need it, which means you've identified a problem that a group of people have and you're going to solve it at scale by providing this SaaS tool. In other words, you already know how to solve that problem, even without building the SaaS tool. But why would anyone buy your product before it even exists? Well, because you'll be offering something much more valuable in exchange. You'll be solving the problem for them, even if it's not in a scalable form yet. It could be a one-on-one -on -one consultation or a pairing session or anything you can offer that is worth much more than they would pay for to do the same thing with a SaaS tool. To make this more concrete, let's say your SaaS product is a book printing application. So your users will be able to write some text and add some photos and then get a great looking physical book, right? So let's imagine for a second that's what you want to build. And you don't have the product just yet, but you want to get validation that there are people that will buy this product when it's done. Just from the top of my head, you could validate this idea in two different ways. One option could be to offer to edit and format the text and images for them and get the book in their hands without them doing anything except provide you with the assets. This option will validate demand, but not the fact that people would want to use your app. The second option is to put together a few open source libraries for a text editor and do the printing manually, meaning you'd take the text they've put in, format it by hand using a third-party design tool, and then take it to print and ship the book. And to make the offer more valuable, you can offer to help them with the editing or storytelling. The point is to get validation on your idea before you start investing your time into writing code. At this point, you're ready to start writing some code. But investing vast amounts of time into it should be avoided as much as possible, because your resources are limited when you're the only person in the business. So a good way to approach this phase is to ask your users for what they need the most. Those features will be the high priority tasks when it comes to writing code. If you happen to choose Rails to do this, you want to also have a balance of tests and implementation code where you're covering the most ground without spending too much time. In other words, you want to prioritize feature tests over unit tests for the most part. And once your features are done, you can pretty much repeat the process. You do some initial market research, asking users for what they need, browsing forums, reviews, etc. You brainstorm how you can solve the new problem in the least amount of time, you validate the idea by selling it, and you write some code only as the last resort. Now you know how to start creating leverage to move away from selling your time and into a place where you create value once, and then you get paid for long periods of time for that investment. And I'm not saying this is easy to do by any means, or that it's the best goal for everybody. I just want you to know that this path is available for you to choose. And now you know how to do it. Secret number four, finding work. So far, I've been talking about how to go up the value ladder and unlock unlimited earning potential by going from employee to freelancer and from freelancer to business owner. And of course, you don't have to follow this path if you think it's not for you. But no matter if you do follow this path or not, there's one skill above all you'll need to be able to find work. If you're looking for a job, you'll want to know how to find a job. And if you're a business owner or a freelancer, you'll need to know how to get clients and customers. And that skill is called sales. I know with this crowd, the word sales isn't particularly popular, but bear with me. First of all, 
I'm not going to teach you how to sell. This is not that kind of a presentation. But what I am going to do is tell you about something I've learned from selling online products and services to clients. I mentioned earlier that I'm running a Rails course and I know a lot of students are struggling to find jobs, especially when they are just getting started. And for the most part, the reason that's hard is because when you're getting started, you're not producing much value for the business. So one thing you'll want to do is make sure you invest a lot of time in getting better. But that's not what I want to tell you about. What I do want to tell you about is how the process of selling either your skill set as an employee or products and services as a business works. And it's called the numbers game. If you've never heard about it before, it simply means for anything that you sell, the vast majority will not want it. And there are going to be a few which will buy it. So let's take a generic example like a storage subscription, you know, like Dropbox, Google Drive, iCloud, and others. So for this SaaS product, if you were to look at their conversion rates, meaning the ratio between the number of people who looked at their offer and the ones who have bought, you'll notice there's a tiny percentage of people that buy the thing versus the ones that just visit the offer and leave. The conversion rate is somewhere around 2%. And it's exactly like that for all the services and all the products in most industries. You can even look it up. So 98% of people who are interested in some form or another don't buy. The reasons for why they don't buy are not relevant. But what I want to point out is it doesn't matter if you're selling socks, iPads, consulting, freelancing, or your skill set, the same numbers game applies. There are going to be a lot of people that look at your profile and go, nah. But every 100 people, there are going to be one or two that will be a lot more interested in whatever it is that you're offering. So what does that mean? Well, it means you need higher numbers. If you need to sell 100 products per month, you probably need around 5,000 people to see the offer. And if you need a job, you probably need at least 100 people to see your CV, assuming it's good enough. In other words, you need to expose your products, services, and skill set to a lot of people before anyone will buy. That's called marketing. And I know a lot of you will wonder how does marketing work for getting jobs. And the answer is networking. You can participate in meetups, conferences, hackathons, you name it, you need to expose your skill set to lots of companies that need it. Secret number five, mindset is everything. If what I've been saying so far is new to you, you'll notice these concepts will change how you think about your career, goals, pricing, and other things like that. I know they've changed mine. New ideas will help you realize that things you've never imagined are within reach. There's a cool story about this guy named Roger Bannister and how he became the first person in the world to run a mile in under four minutes. And what's interesting about this story is that before he did that, everyone thought it's physically impossible to do it. So they didn't even try. It was a mindset limitation, not a physical one. Once people got over that limitation by seeing someone else do it, they could pass the barrier themselves. And people have been beating his record again and again ever since. It's the same with whatever you want to do in your life. And it starts with you believing it's possible. It starts with you opening your mind and allowing new ideas to come in. Whatever you want to do in your life, there's a very high chance that someone else already did it. Maybe not exactly like you want it, but it's probably very close. So it would make sense for you to learn from them to read their books, ask them questions, study their work, and avoid their mistakes. It's not that you cannot do it yourself, but it's much faster if you learn from others who've already done it. Time is the most scarce resource you'll ever have, so it makes sense for you to use it wisely. To give you an example, say you're someone who wants to learn Ruby on Rails for the first time to get hired as a Rails developer. One option could be to dive in head first and waste incredible amounts of time until you're ready to apply for the job. And I'm sure that given enough persistence, you'd get there. But 
it would take a lot of time and effort to do it. On the other hand, you could start by finding a beginner's book, follow its structure, then get another more advanced book, follow that, and so on. You'd get exactly the same result, but with a lot less effort and a lot faster, simply because you took a different route. The difference between the two is, again, mindset. In the first case, you're probably thinking there is nothing others can teach you that you cannot find on your own. Or you might be thinking, why pay for a book when you can find the same information for free on YouTube? And those are valid statements, except they both ignore the value of time. In the first case, you're sifting through different articles or videos to find the information you need, trying it out to see if it works, figuring out why it doesn't work, making sure that the topics are in the right order, and so on. Not to mention, you're most likely to not know what you're doing. So, that adds even more pain to the problem. But in the second case, where you accept help and open your mind for new ideas, you'd be reading a book or watching a course or getting personalized help from a mentor, and you'd be saving a lot of your time by following their instructions. It's just a different mindset, and it applies to everything you do. Can you guess how I know this? Well, I made the same mistake. I thought building my own business would be an easy way to get out of the 9 to 5, and I also thought it would probably take me about 3 to 6 months before people would start rushing to pay for it. How hard could it be? I already know how to build software, right? Well, it took me 10 years before I would make my first sale. 10 years of learning by stumbling and failing over and over again simply because I thought I could do it myself and I could save a few thousand dollars that way. And I did, but it cost me 10 years. So hopefully you're smarter than me and you won't make the same mistakes that I've done. So let me recap the five secrets. The first one is about realizing that if you want to be free to work on projects you love and with people you like, big tech jobs are not the best way to get there. The second is about choosing the generalist path and value pricing your freelancing work so you can work less, making the same amount of money or even more. The third is about how becoming a business owner can get you unlimited earning potential and ultimately the freedom to do whatever you want whenever you want to do it. The fourth secret is all about using the numbers game method to take the stress out of finding work as an employee or clients and customers for your business. And finally, the fifth secret is all about mindset and how anything you want to do in your life is within reach if you open your mind for new ideas and adopt the right mindset.